Hello and welcome to the Connection webinar series. We are now in week three and this is track one of this week's sessions. We are looking today at e-commerce. It's the uh, one aspect of corrugated packaging that seems to have had some significant growth rates over the last few years. And today I am joined by four individuals from uh, within the machinery and supply sector. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the uh, concepts around e-commerce. Um, I'm joined by Gilbert Zhu from um, the Bob's Group. We have Ulrich Voltz from Barmuller. We're welcoming Simon Needham from Colbus Autobox and also Jan Brunner from Marbach. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Um, I hope this is going to be uh, an interesting uh, conversation for the next 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, so, Gilbert, I'd like to come to you first, if I may, um, from the Bob's group. Um, there's been a significant growth in, in e-commerce, um, and it was very interesting uh, to note. I, I was talking with uh, Tony Smurfis on a recent podcast um, talking about the, the growth of uh, e-commerce. Um, do you feel that over the last seven months uh, since lockdown uh, that we've seen uh, massive growth numbers in e-commerce? Or do you think that uh, e-commerce has, has actually been seeing significant growth uh, consistently before COVID crisis? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, I, I, I will try to answer quite quickly. I, I don't have all the data in mind, but I, what I can see, the uh, if we have a look on the uh, latest report on the corrugated packaging, the market, it's, uh, it's growing about... Uh, I would say 4% every year. Right? And the key key driver are today the increase of, of uh, income, the, the lifestyle changing, and the population growing. And the end user grow, it's mainly on the digital and the retail uh, through uh, e-commerce and plus of uh, traditional retail and uh, electronic goods. And uh, the, uh, the e-commerce is driving a lot of uh, important growth on the corrugated market. And uh, probably, and certainly, the pandemic has accelerated the shift from uh, analog to uh, to digital uh, behaviors. On uh, before the pandemic, I, I don't have the latest uh, numbers online, but I, I know that the uh, before the pandemic, it was foreseen a growth of about 15 uh, percent in 2020 for uh, for e-commerce, and uh, with this is already a, a grow annual grow of 24 uh, percent. And then the, with, with the pandemic, we can probably expect an, action, an additional growth of uh, around 6 of, uh, or 10 percent. And uh, the, the result of this is the uh, e-commerce is using a lot of packaging and uh, is growing by, by 40 percent per annum. And uh, it's composed by almost 80 percent of corrugated material, which is very uh, significant. So that is the main reason that the uh, the corrugated packaging has, and, and the corrugated has a, a very good grow, a big grow due to the uh, the uh, the e-commerce and the internet uh, internet commerce. And 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 Gilbert, do you have um, do you have a feeling or, or um, some um, substantiated numbers um, that would enable us to look at? Um, what is the most popular way of uh, running the e-commerce um, uh, packaging styles? Is it being done um, in two processes? So in other words, you know, die cutting and then uh, folding and gluing, uh, or, or are companies tending to try and do it on uh, an inline process? So like a, a yeah. flexo case maker. Yeah, yeah. The, the main driver is a flexo FG uh, process, and they are producing the the majority of uh, e-commerce boxes and then of course we 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 can produce some envelopes on uh, on the flatbed die cutting using the the, uh, the accuracy we can reach on a, on a flatbed die cutter due to uh, due to a liner due to different kind of uh, tooling we can use for uh, this uh, specific uh, e-commerce and of course on the folder gluing with uh, also some dedicated uh, equipment like a gyro box and a tear tape application, and uh, on, but on the, on the die cutter itself, 
the uh, I, I would say it's it's more related with the complexity of boxes and the complexity of uh, of, um, of packaging, especially on uh, on on the envelopes. We can see a, a huge grow on the on this demand, and uh, it make a big difference compared with uh, with the FFG. The, uh, this is uh, added value we we, we can bring. On, uh, on, uh, on this kind of packaging due to the, uh, the, the, the process of flat bicotter. Yes, definitely. But the main driver on uh, producing boxes, it's uh, my colleague from Lyon, it's uh, on, on the FFG, on the FFG side, yes. So um, Ulrich um, from Bar Muller, um, obviously you as a uh, business, you specialize in, in creating um, you know, the single line uh, in terms of uh, part of the process. Uh, I know you have a tie up with, with non another German manufacturer where you, you're producing a unit that um, goes in line with a, a flexo rotary die cutter. But if we can um, look specifically now at speciality gluing, because it's something that Gilbert was talking about there, is it, talking about the intricacy um, of the design of some of these e-commerce solutions, um, do you feel that it's fair to say that um, the more intricate the design, you have to do it on a standalone gluer versus in line? Yes, you have uh, much more opportunities with the speciality for the gluer com compared to a standard FFG. And this is the big growth what we uh, learn in our industry. So um, if we have opportunities, and uh, Schubert mentioned it already, if we go in the backs, and uh, that was in one time um, when Amazon moved into plastics also, but now we are back in the backs, and this is a big increase in the, for the corrugated industry. And um, there was also um, conversation um, a little bit earlier from Gilbert about uh, also automation um, and, and how how important are uh, the peripheral processes um, in terms of the um, you know the takeoff and the stacking of of these intricate types of boxes? What developments are being made in in that um, aspect of automation? Yes. Automation is there a very big thing in my opinion because we have uh, these um, order runs are in hundreds of thousands and you can't pick them anymore by hand. So that's important that you have automation um, end of line and also in front of the line. Okay, and uh, let's let's start looking a little bit now at the um, the actual die cutting process. Um, and I, I'd like to bring onto the line um, Jan Brunner, please, um, from from Marbach. Um, Jan, thanks for for joining us. Um, and um, I know that um, we had a few uh, issues trying to get you connected, but um, we've got you on the phone, which is fantastic. Um, Jan. Uh, it's very important that the uh, all of the uh, consumable parts and the um, the die tools, etc., everything is is laid out correctly for uh, for the die cutting process, um, particularly when we're talking about the e-commerce. Um, Jan, can you tell us uh, a little bit about um, some of the developments that have been made over the last few years in terms of you know the quality of the materials that are being used in in modern dies etc that are enhancing the life of of the dies for for the die cutting process uh, and how important that is for uh, accurate um, creation of the die cut pieces sure then so what what we see of the spectrum of e-commerce is mainly the intricate, complicated designs where you need uh, flatbed die cutting so that we can uh, build a tool for that. And these are mainly, let's say, branded boxes, even going into the luxury segment. And um, I know a few of these from, from home. And when you see what, what requirements they need to fulfill in terms of really nice, clean edges, there can't be any waste inside. You can't have any angel hair or debris inside the boxes. Then, of course, these have higher um, requirements to the cutting tool then you might have for other uh, just transport boxes that never reach the home of a consumer and that's why it's important to to choose the right uh, type of cutting rule have the right rubber in place and there are even developments where rubber is replaced with other uh, types of uh, 
uh, of components that you put inside a die to, to make sure that the consistency of the cut is, uh, is the same all throughout the run. And, uh, and then from cutting, we go into creasing because you want the boxes to fold right, you need the right creasing parameters. There's more and more the tendency for complicated designs to also run steel counters in the corrugated flatbed die cutting. So uh, I think once once the uh, the value of the boxes increase or the complexity because uh, because we want to uh, address the, the consumer in a different way, then also the requirements for the die cutting process and the die cutting tool increase. And then it's really up to the die maker and uh, to the customer to jointly decide the specifications of the tool and what goes inside. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jan, it was, it, it's interesting because um, you mentioned something there that, that I think is really important when we're looking at e-commerce, um, and that is talking about the, the actual design of uh, the packaging. Um, I, I was reading a fascinating article written by um, one of the packaging technologists at DS Smith, um, and they were talking about um, what happens if you're able to reduce, um, even by one millimeter, um, the effect and the impact that that has on, um, you know, reduction in material usage, um, more opportunity to stack more on a on a um, on a pallet, etc. As, as a provider of um, you know tooling and systems and equipment within die cutting, um, how much work do you do with the box makers and their design departments to help them look at ways of of reducing the amount of material that's used? Uh, indeed, uh, then this has become quite the topic because as designs get more complex, also you get into the issue of how you can nest these designs on your printing and die cutting layout. And, and that gives you again some opportunities in flatbed die cutting versus the rotary or, or even inline processing. And um, and then when it comes to the design, um, we hope to be included at the earliest possible stage um, in terms of, of material savings, of optimization of the sheet usage. But also when you think of all the uh, opening mechanisms that there are perforations, reverse cutting, and uh, a lot of, of creativity of the designers is then confronted by the, the possibilities in manufacturing. And the earlier such a conversation can happen, the, the better results we usually achieve. Mm -hmm. And um, Gilbert, can I come to, to you, please? Um, because I want to, to carry on this theme of the importance of um, designing out um, uh, material, et cetera, because obviously we, we've seen over the last um, decade, uh, particularly in, in Europe, there has been um, significant uh, reduction in um, raw material uh, basis weights. Um, and, you know, there's been a move to a lot of um, obviously recycled uh, liners and test liners. Um, what sort of impact has the uh, the lighter weight packaging had in terms of um, you know the box makers still having to create a very robust um, uh, piece of packaging for, for for the transit of often you know goods that are, are relatively expensive? Um, how are they coping with that um, lighter weight material usage? I, I, I would say yes. The uh, to, to degrees the uh, the. Um... The paper grade, it, it's a good way to, to, to save money for packaging, of course. Huh? And uh, if we talk about for the, for the gluer, and uh, they, 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 I would say that the aspect, aspect of the most important is the creasing, and the creasing is doing on a, on a, on a flatbed die cutter. And uh, for to, to, uh, to avoid any, any scratch, any, any defect on box, so we have to, to work on, on this specific tooling we have to work also on a, on a, on the machine itself, uh, reducing as much as possible the pressure on the, on the flatbed die cutter, using uh, a flatbed as as flat as possible. And uh, because the uh, the pressure, and the quality of rubber, quality of um, of uh, uh, tooling, it's a it's it's a key huh? if you want to 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 get the very good quality of uh, final boxes. And uh, on the, on the, on the flatbed die cutter. It's mainly on the on the feeder section and uh, on the flat flatbed die cutter itself, where we can we can um, we can save money 
using the right tooling and to, to get very uh, a nice quality of boxes without any and with a minimum of of, uh, of, of waste. And of course, the uh, the, the waste and the the the, uh, uh, the the waste on the on the stripping section also should be uh, as as big and as as, as as short as possible, I would say. But uh, it make also um, on a differentiation to make sure that all the waste are, are removed and they, you do not, at the end, damage the uh, the final boxes when you, you feed on a, on, a, on the fold glue. But for the fold glue uh, itself, the issue we have to face is the quality of freezing, it's the quality of uh, um, of uh, die cutting to reach a good quality of uh, of uh, final good good um, good uh, quality of uh, of gap and uh, without any uh, uh, fish shelling. And this is also valid for uh, for FFG process, of course. And the design, the know of the operator, tooling, patching, flatness, as I said just before, it's it's, it's a key for quality and also it's a key to uh, to make possible to to run. A very light uh, paper grade, and to save money at the end. Well, um, I, I think it's um, it's you know quite interesting that uh, obviously w w with the. With the volume machines, um, it, you know, you're, you're looking at producing uh, pack types that uh, may be produced in bulk. Um, there's obviously an aspect to e-commerce. Uh, where we start now talking about shorter run, uh, almost sometimes bespoke, um, one-off pieces, et cetera. Um, Simon, um, Simon from uh, Colbus Autobox, I'd like to come to you, if I may. Um, Simon, we, we obviously see um, from um, you know, the, the bigger part of the market, the, the mainstream box plants that are producing high volumes for, for the likes of uh, Amazon and eBay, et cetera. But um, there are obviously opportunities for a much shorter run. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, about what's been going on in um, sort of short run machinery development, um, you know, looking at how machines are, are obviously, you know, quick set, uh, allowing you to be ultra responsive. Mm -hmm. um, give us an update on, on, on what's been happening in this part of the market. Well, it's a, the thing you're right, when, when people talk about e-commerce, they're generally thinking of the bigger names in the market because they're the ones that spring to mind. Um, but there are thousands upon thousands of smaller businesses that as the well e-commerce has opened the globe to, to small businesses to be able to put their products in in front of everybody globally and they want to give their customers a similar experience to the bigger guys um so they, they want the correct packaging um as well but are not always in a place to order big quantities they haven't got the space they haven't got the inventory but they do ha they are shipping out all sorts of different shapes and sizes every day so it, we, we have a different set of challenges in front of us um it's not so much about the waste aspect of it because if you're only making 50 boxes it doesn't matter if it's 10 percent waste uh one percent is is not on our radar at all um but we do want to make it as good fitting. Uh, well, one of the big things we have to do, we're working to stock sizes of sheets. So you're just producing from whatever you have uh, rather than uh, buying into the to the correct sizes. So it's, it's all about the flexibility and the service that you're offering. So whilst it doesn't necessarily sit in the same sort of business concept as volume, uh, it potentially is more uh, lucrative. Um, but you do also need that level of, of, of um, personalization to it. And so in terms of where we're trying to take our machines, we've always tried to uh, have machines that don't use tooling so that they're quick set, easy, easy for people to use. And I think with automation coming along as it is, we're seeing more ability to do perforation. We are looking at tear tapes. We're looking at inline inkjet and, and all these things that help a box become uh, a more valuable commodity. And, um, you know, one of the uh, points that we were talking about earlier, um, Simon, where, where, 
it's the importance of, of actually making sure that uh, that a box does fit the product. Um, uh, again, uh, picked up on um, Tony Smurfit's podcast, um, he said that his um, his sort of packaging design team had found somewhere in the region of five million videos uh, online, uh, which are negative uh, reaction to. I mean, we've all been on the receiving end of it, where we've we've ordered some new biros and they've arrived in a box as, as you know as big as your head and. And uh, inside is, uh, you know, just uh, one biro. So, so obviously, um, the short run um, uh, equipment allows you to uh, to produce, um, you know, almost a, at a bespoke size. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, ha have you seen growth um, in the sort of sheet plant market for for the short run equipment um, and the sort of the stock manufacturers of boxes to to, to try and help um, develop these solutions for e commerce? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, as you say, nobody wants to be shipping air anymore. Um, and it's about the protection of the product inside it. And people don't want to be putting massive boxes into, into a bin, having just taken out a very small product from it, because it's not a satisfying experience. So uh, customization bespoke boxes uh, for smaller quantities of potentially more expensive items. I think when you look at what people have been buying during lockdown, lots of garden furniture they're not going on holiday so they are doing a bit of diy home renovations and a lot of what we do or our machines and the machines like it do are for larger products so it's certainly you know, potentially more valuable products where uh to have the correct size packaging on demand because they are in the smaller quantities is, is massively important um, so um, I'd like to move um, back to now uh, pretty much the mainstream uh, e-commerce uh, packaging solutions. Um, and um, Ulrich, I'd like to, to come to you, please. Um, I'd like to ask um, what part um, digitization has in terms of, you know, when we're looking at um, you know, shorter orders, for example, maybe promotional items that may well have been digitally printed. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the uh, quality assurance mechanisms that are now available um, to track the progress of the boxes as they go through the, the folding and gluing process? Because um, surely if, if you're producing um, very short uh, run or even uh, unique boxes uh, that have been digitally printed, printed how do you um, how do you keep control of those and track them through that gluing process yeah good question and uh, we are using detection systems there we, we did developments together with uh, other companies for code readers for example because as you say if we are talking in small quantities it's quite important that we can also give information with the goods with the product through the process and uh, then if there are additional units used um, also having the opportunities if we have um, to check whether the diagonals for example on the crash lock are really folded and finally then check it if needed before it goes into the uh, packing system packer system or on the pallet and um, when we also uh, start talking about, um, you know, smaller pieces um, in terms of uh, unique items, um, obviously uh, there are the um, uh, opportunities to add um, the sort of tracking uh, codes and the tracking items that can be glued onto the boxes. Um, again, whereabouts in the process uh, does that tend to happen where the tags are applied? You are, you're talking about labeling systems, for example, where we can have a QR code on the machine. This is applied right in the in the final folding section or right in front of the press conveyor. And uh, this is a unique code. And uh, yes, um, it has to be really individual for each box. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so. Um... Gilbert, I'd like to, uh, to to come back to uh, to the Bob's side as well, because um, obviously uh, there has to be an awful lot of um, you know automation in terms of the reading of the data, the the visibility of the data when we start talking about um, shorter runs. Um, 
what um, what work have you been doing with some of the software suppliers um, uh, to, to sort of track the data as as the items are going through in terms of you know the jobs are being processed? So we we, we are working on the uh, a new solution and uh, to uh, to uh, to track the tooling and to uh, to know exactly what is the situation, what is the condition of the tooling. And uh, also with all the data regarding the cutting rules, along the cutting rule length, quality of rubber, and uh, and whatever. And uh, this is a, a real added value for uh, our customer because they he can he can track and uh, to check every day the uh, the quality of his uh, his dye. He can also uh, store in the in this uh, in this uh, tooling. The, uh, all the information regarding the the, uh, the process itself, if, if it needs to, to make uh, or to pay attention for things, dedicate uh, specific things on a on, on the packaging, it's a uh, it's uh, a tool link, a solution with uh, all the uh, opportunity for for customers to uh, to track online and to uh, to to be uh, digital, I would say. Huh? But it's it's a real uh, a real plus. And uh, also, it's uh, it's something we are working with um, with a dedicated uh, supplier on, on, on a dye maker, I would say, to uh, to make sure all the information are on this uh, dedicated uh, ships, I would say, something like this, and um, and make sure also the uh, the dye maker it's um, has all the knowledge. To, to to make and to uh, to serve this uh, this tooling, but it's uh, for for us for uh, for our company uh, for customers, it's a, a real added value to to track and to to have all all this information stored on the on, on the on the tooling itself, and this, this is valid for die cutting and uh, stripping uh, stripping die as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I, I think we've we've reached a stage now where um, I'm going to ask you all to uh, to look into the the future a little bit, um, and I really want to um, ask each of you uh, what you feel um, is going to be uh, the next sort of big development that will help uh, this continuing growth of e-commerce. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a revolutionary um, um, sort of process, but I'm, ju I'm just really um, interested to, to hear from each of you. Uh, and I'm going to come to, to Jan first um, from Marbach. Um, Jan, do you have anything that you feel is, is sort of on the horizon or that's uh, going to be coming in the next few years that is going to help change the way that we make our uh, e-commerce packaging? <laughs> Well, then, unfortunately, my crystal ball doesn't tell me about these things yet. Um, <laughs> so, and, and typically, it, it's funny you ask me first because as a tool maker, you're, you're, you're uh, normally later in, in the chain and you only can react to, to the things that, that are predetermined by the equipment that is installed at the customer and so on. Um, so I think at the moment, in these highly dynamic times, we can just watch, see where the trends go and try to react as soon as possible and then also help to bring our customers up to speed so that uh, they can keep up with all these new developments. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, um, sorry for coming to you first then, Jan, but um, um, uh, Gilbert, let's uh, come to you. Uh, what do you feel uh, might be of interest for, uh, for converters uh, over the coming uh, months and years? I would say on the coming on the coming years, it's a uh, as I said before, uh, for uh, tooling, it's uh, connectivity and uh, digitalization. Uh, maybe the future it's to to start to produce packaging uh, with a digital uh, with a digital machines instead of uh, conventional machines to uh, to to be quick on uh, on uh, uh, quick on, uh, on the commerce the very uh, short lead time. Maybe it's uh, for the future. We have to think about. We talk about the uh, the printing, digital printing. Maybe on a, on a digital converting. It's something we have to to think about. 
and maybe okay. it's a future <laughs> for uh, for short run uh, and uh, so mainly for short run because so I, as you everybody knows uh, the run are getting short and shorter and uh, maybe digital is uh, one of the uh, avenue to to reach uh, and the, to, to to keep our competitivity for customers. Okay, and um, Ulrich, um, fr from uh, Bar Muller's point of view, uh, is there is there something exciting on the horizon, or are you um, keeping things under wraps for us at the moment? Lucky us to be end of the line of all my panel speakers. Um, yes, we already can say we can convert digital, as we are holding already digital printed boxes. But um, we are also focusing mainly on setup times to keep that process uh, digitalized. That means if we have a, a CAD drawing that everything is brought digital to the machine to shorten the setup time and that most of the setting is fully automated. This is what we are focusing on as uh, our lines are already automated with uh, uh, upstream equipment and downstream equipment, as you know, and so setting is the main purpose on a speciality called the blower. Okay, and um, Simon, from the short um, box um, producing side of things, uh, particularly for e-commerce, um, anything exciting on the horizon for us? Um, you, you, you mentioned maybe in passing there, uh, in inline inkjet um, possibility. I mean, is is this all yeah. uh, on the horizon and about for launch? Um, we're we're very close. Yeah, um, I think anything that allows you to personalise, deliver, and be flexible, it, it deliver what people want when they want it, is obviously going to help you. And that's the whole driver, not just behind e-commerce, but everything in life these days. Digital print is is certainly one. Um, and anything, as, as Ulrich was saying, that makes the setup time easier and shorter and the changeover between one and the next is, is going to help everybody. So, you know, the future is kind of already here, but we just improve all the time. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. It's um, It's been a fascinating um, 35 minutes. Um, so just to to summarize we've we've been looking at um the process of uh tooling and die cutting and the folding and gluing of um e-commerce packaging um we've been looking at um short run on demand and um the uh, the growth trajectory for for this particular sector within the global corrugated industry so um gentlemen i know that each of you will be on the showground floor so i'm sure that if any of the attendees listening to the webinar right now uh, have any further questions i'm sure they can come and find you out um so we look forward to uh, seeing you all on the uh, the show floor and uh, gentlemen uh, simon ulrich Jan, Gilbert, thank you very much indeed for your time, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to the Connection webinar series. We are on week three, track two. And this afternoon, we are going to be looking at the future for the corrugating process. Uh, we've got gathered today um, some fantastic speakers for you. Uh, we're going to be looking at individual aspects of the corrugating process um, from the raw material uh, into the factory um, through the entire corrugating process and a way into work in progress. Today, I am joined by Tim Straker from FOSBA. We have Dominique Raveau from the Ducker Group. We have Martin McTeague from BW Paper Systems. Delighted to welcome Ralph Shoemaker from Erhart & Lima, the Corrugated Division. James Nelson from EFI and Simon Holmes from JKSP Services. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. Um, Tim, I'd like to come to you first, if I may. Um, Tim, we've we've seen over the last few years that uh, machines have obviously got wider and faster. Uh, we're looking at higher outputs, um, volume machines, effectively. Um, do you see that uh, the trend is going to continue? Is it just going to get wider and faster? Afternoon, Dan. Hello, everybody. Um, at 
response, but no, we don't think that's going to be the trend. We, we think, uh, as you say, light, uh, orders are going to get a lot smaller. Corrugators are going to have to be really, truly digitalized, and that means really short orders. Um, and we, we, are, we see also smaller flutes, speciality flutes. So we see it, there won't be this ongoing trend for wider and faster, but more speciality, able to cope with uh, short orders, lightweights, um, and that's the direction we see really for the next 10 years. Of course, there will still be some uh, wide, high volume machines, but we don't think that will be the overriding trend. And we don't actually think it has been. Um, going over 2.8 meters, there's only really a handful of such corrugators in the world today. And, and Tim, the, the, the larger machines that you talk about, they tend to be focused at the sheet feeding end of the market. Um, so, I mean, do, do you feel that um, obviously with uh, you were talking about digitalization and, and specifically with digital printing, um, obviously there is quite a lot of um, uh, sort of opportunity and, and growth prospects for some of those smaller sheet plants. So surely there is going to be that demand for um, still those those sort of big big format machines for sheet feeding, right? Uh, possibly, but I don't think the... I think you have to be go for precision more than speed because when you're running digital preprint, it's got to be perfect. You can't make waste. You can't mess it up. We've got a few installations running where we are running digital preprint, multiple orders on multiple levels. You need control more than anything rather than speed, and that's what we've seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's interesting, um, Ralph, I'd like to bring you in here because um, Tim was referring there to, um, to, to customers that are running digital preprint. Um, this is one area that, uh, that obviously um, E&L has been uh, working very, very hard at, at um, you know, the control processes. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on in, in that sort of digital preprint arena on corrugators? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Um, the digital preprint is really a paradigm change for all of us. Um, the the analog print is is established in Europe for thirty plus years. Um, a lot of people in Europe are well, not a lot of people, but a lot of plants um, are running uh, uh, the analog uh, print. But this is usually um, the problem that you are running one print job on one roll, and you have to finish that roll, or you're putting it back on uh, on the stock. In the digital world, you are not only able to run different orders in one role, but you can uh, run it in side-by-side -side, uh, applications. You can run, if you have dual stackers, you can run multi-jobs on, uh, on a side-by-side -side setup, and you are running short orders um, after each other. So uh, the order changeover is getting very uh, important in the corrugator because, like Tim said, it's a very expensive substrate to run a digital print roll. If you trash that in your corrugator, it's a very expensive roll to trash. Plus, you are trashing not only the the, uh, the outer liner, but you are trashing, of course, um, the flute, the medium, uh, single or double. So um, the paradigm change really has been that um, these changeovers um, basically take over the order scheduling or not only the order scheduling, but the order processing inside the corrugator. And this, this is what we have been working on for the last four or five years, really, from the first application. Um, and it's running quite successfully now. And, and if we um, if we start talking about the um, digital preprint process that, that you're running it effectively as as the top liner, um, Simon, um, I'd like to come to you, please, um, because obviously when we start talking about the um, you know the final bonding process and um, running through the uh, the double backer. Um, what developments um, ha have been made in in the sort of the double backer side of things over the last uh, few years to actually handle this? Because as Ralph was saying, it's it's a very high value item that's running through, um, and you've got to be careful that you're not damaging that board. Yeah, quite right, Dan. I'd, I'd say the, the the major change that um, we've seen, and obviously we've we've been developing over the years, is is primarily aimed at upgrading some of the older, uh, more restricted types of double backers, um, particularly where um, they were very limited in terms of control. 
So they either could apply a, a single amount of pressure, um, either up or down with your weight rolls or your conventional shoes. This then provided a very small amount of control. Um, as you've seen, the, the papers varying, the weights uh, varying, getting more lightweight, starcher technology changing, um, a lot more um, focus now on getting everything precision, as Tim says. I think that's led into adapting the control of devices so that you can apply that precision. Um, and obviously, we, the, the main OEMs of some of which are here today, they've done some great developments on the newer, the newer machines that have led that way. Um, and I think we, you know, we've been more focused on how can we bring along some of the people that um, you know may not have the millions to spend on a new machine, but in the same respect, don't want to get left behind. Um, so we look at trying to enhance um, the process to give them some more of this precision control, to give them more options, um, so that they can actually um, run the expensive substrates, the process um, at the required settings in terms of temperature and heat transfer. Um, I think it's more than exactly right. I totally agree that there's more and more focus now. There's always been a focus on reduced waste. But now, as we enter the sort of digital age, the substrates are so much more expensive um, and better to run it at a consistent and steady speed, but, but with, with high quality. Um, so I, I think there's got to be a lot of development. You know, the main OEMs are doing it for the, for the newer machines, of course. Um, we, we're focused on the... Um, uh, providing some other options for people that are sitting there with some, with some older machines, um, but also upgrading them without putting a, a full system on. So we sort of sit in between, in between there. But I think that's got to happen because not everybody can um, jump in, and, you know, with spending multi millions. But in the same respect, they have to do something if they're going to enter that new new type of production. Sure. Um, Tim, um, I think you, you wanted to add something in there for us, Tim. Important what Simon's saying about uh, retrofitting systems on existing corrugators. When we're talking about digital preprint, a lot of a lot of the players have already gone into it. They want to run it on existing corrugators. And our idea is that anyone who can run conventional analog preprint with a few tweaks and modifications can run it on their uh, existing corrugator. And just to point out as well, we're, we're seeing it run both on the bottom liner and the top liner. So there's no reason why you can't do it uh, on, on either liner. You know, and I'm sure Ralph from e &L can uh, can verify that with the control systems that he's, he's got in place. But there is a, a very big push and desire to be able to run digital preprint on existing corrugators, not only on brand new ones. OK, um, Martin, um, I, I'd like to come to you, please, uh, Martin, from BW Paper Systems. Um, um, we've done a little bit there on, on sort of high value, um, you know, digitally printed liners, et cetera. But um, there's no doubt that in, in Europe there has been a um, significant move over the last um, decade, at least, for um, recycled and lighter weight liners. Um, and we're starting to see that trend um, really starting to take a grip in uh, the North American market as well. Um, can you give us a little um, uh, sort of viewpoint as to um, how the uh, the domestic American um, market is starting to um, uh, adopt the the lighter weight? Because I'm guessing they're they're under considerable pressure from um, the brand owners, the stakeholders. Um, and obviously, you know, there's an awful lot of investment from uh, companies like um, uh, Vizzy, uh, Pratt, in terms of, um, you know, building uh, new recycled mill capacity. So um, talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the corrugating process over in uh, the North American market with recycled liners. Well, you're, you're definitely right, Dan. Um, the American market is changing with respect to the paper grades being used. And... Uh, We've had the good fortune working both in Asia and Europe, so we're, we're, we know what the paper grades are like and where they're, where they're heading to. And that is definitely um, happening in the US also. People like Pratt, you got David S. Smith starting up a greenfield site in the US, wanting to take European practice into the North American market. You recently saw Saika making a similar announcement. And 
what I would say is that the preconception of the US are all running heavy virgin uh, liners and, and uh, heavy mediums. That is no longer the case. Uh, there has been a trend for the last few years to reduce the paper grades, um, build equipment that will not crush the board. So with less scrammage, you still get the same strength on the box. And uh, just like um, uh, what Tim was saying, you know, uh, people want to modify existing corrugators in the US to run lighter grade papers too. And, and uh, thankfully we've had some experience in doing that in the Asia and in Europe. So we can transfer that technology or use the technology in the US as well. Uh, but definitely the, the market is changing in the US and it'll go lighter and lighter over the next few years. That's that's definitely a fact. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, let, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about um, the actual uh, raw material and the process with which we handle it. Um, Dominique, um, I, I'd like to come to you, please, from, from uh, Ducker Group. Um, Dominique, obviously, the uh, the movement of the raw material is is critical. Um, you know, ensuring that the the reels are handled correctly, because you know, as we were just uh, discussing, we're, we're now dealing with some um, high value paper particularly when we're talking about uh, preprint and digital preprint. Um, can you give us a little bit uh, of an update as, in terms of, you know, what's been happening with the, uh, the sort of uh, handling processes? Uh, are we starting to see more, um, you know, robotic systems um, being developed, um, you know, the track and trace, et cetera? Um, tell us what's going on uh, from that side of the business. Thanks, Dan. Uh... Hello, everybody. So, I mean, it's clear that uh, we are going now to more, uh, more and more automize the process. There is corrugator manufacturer which are designing their their own system. I mean, there is uh, suppliers of uh, handling equipment which are uh, coming into that field. Suppliers of uh, paper machines also, which are uh, coming to to, uh, to try to work in that thing. So, the, the the target is really to get rid of the people uh, getting to one, to more and more automation in order to, I mean, secure the, uh, the the process itself, remove mistakes, and also remove some some people which are, I mean, it's not an easy job. It's heavy thing, so it's good also to look to this uh, automation. So. I mean, everything like uh, trustability, uh, connection, the web um, uh, big data, they will help also to improve this uh, further and get a better control of this uh, of this process for the, um, the role which are coming into the machine, but also for the rest of the role which will come back, which need to be stored and, and reused in a, in a good way. So the, and, uh, uh yeah, sorry, Dominic. Carry on. No, no. Uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Um, and um, Dominic, you were talking there about um, you know the the uh, Internet of Things and big data. Um, obviously, it's it's a critical process in terms of the movement of the material around the factory, um, and obviously integration with uh, not just the plant systems but also the the corrugator itself. Um, you know, how much um, sort of work is, is is being done from from your side in terms of integration with with some of these uh, systems and processes? I mean, we have really to look to the plant as a complete uh, complete tool. And uh, I mean, tomorrow any uh, supervision system should be able to look to uh, everything which is inside the plant and everything which is around the plants. I mean, so, so to connect with suppliers, to connect with uh, with uh, customers and be able to, to get uh, uh, information about all the flow of uh, material inside the plant. So from the raw uh, material outside of the corrugator, converting machine and uh, finished goods. And um, more and more uh, components in the factory will be able to be added to this uh, network. So, I mean, we can imagine that we get a lot, a lot of data which will be able to get out. And the big question will be how to treat this, uh, those data to classify them and to get uh, a smart way to get them back to the operators, to the manager of the of, of the plants. We know, I mean, we uh, we all see, and not only in corrugated, but in daily life, that there is more and more uh, items which are connected to the web, which are giving data. But what will be important 
tomorrow is how you collect, how you analyze that data, how you track them to be sure that they are right, and how you can use it to make a, a smarter way, shorter, uh, a shorter lead time, uh, reduce waste, and all those things, which at the end of the day will be the, the payback of all that uh, system. Okay. Um, James, I'm going to come to, uh, to you now. Um, James from EFI. Um, all of the gentlemen so far have been talking about um, data, um, processes, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, you know, as we were saying, we're moving into industry 4.0. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you guys have been up to in terms of, you know, developing your systems um, to, to, to help the machines, you know, start thinking for themselves, recording of information. Um, t tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I agree with um, the comments from uh, the previous gentleman there as well in terms of the importance of data because what it's really about is getting to the right person to make actionable insights and, and actionable decisions that, at the right time, particularly when you look at the costs involved and the waste in the whole, in the whole process. Um, we, we've been taking an approach very much of, of looking for the right acquisitions from a software point of view to try and at least uh, build a framework for what we call a digital ecosystem. Um, it's a term that's very broadly banded around, I think, in, in many industries. Um, but it's been a model that's been successful for us at EFI, I think, in, in other industries where perhaps from a digital maturity perspective, we're a little bit more advanced than what the corrugated industry is in terms of, for example, commercial print or in, in textiles where digital transformation is... I would say a little bit further ahead. Um, so with the ecosystem concept, um, and obviously we've got the, the companies represented here on this panel with fantastic innovations and technology. I think what we're trying to do conceptually with the ecosystem is, is put together building blocks with right levels of connectivity so that we can link more of the plant together um, through things like workbench. We call it our, our productivity workbench. I'm sorry. Uh, to mention, but uh, just just having that um, management information dashboard essentially that gives the right level of information at the right time and pulls from all the different elements of the factory, whether it be the control systems on the corrugator, on the wet and dry end, the um, the conveyor systems. You know that that's something that isn't even, I guess, from a, from our perspective, discussed yet. But but all these elements that, that play a role in taking material, you know, from from an order at, at the front end office to um, to the um, to the trailer on the back end of the plant, um, being able to have that data and use it in a way, for example, to inform the schedule, um, influence things like intelligent speed control again on the on the control system, where if there's a bottleneck further up the line or if one of the conveyors goes down, you know, using that intelligent speed control to, for example, slow down the corrugator and, and adjust and react to that impact that's further down down the chain. So using some of that technology to help um, ultimately get, you know, material out from one end to the other in a, in a much more efficient way, mm. using the technology and, that other partners have yeah. developed as well. And, and James, um, it, it was quite interesting. You were just talking there about, um, you know, the entire plant uh, visibility. Uh, and if there's a problem in the um, you know, end of line strapper and, you know, at the back of a high speed case maker, et cetera, um, how how difficult has it been trying to work with with customers to actually get them to trust uh, the systems in terms of you know the data is telling us we need to slow the machine down uh, otherwise we're going to you know crash into a brick wall here um, how difficult is it sort of educating customers that, that the system is here to help them not uh, not hold them back I think it's it's a great question. Um... And, and I would say, honestly, it's, it's probably very challenging because I think if you look at um, the skill sets now, even of roles of people in the businesses where typically engineering guys would typically make decisions on investments and, and strategy and things, I think what companies now are looking more to uh, from a skill set perspective is having more of an IT mix um, in the whole setup and structure of the plant, which I think will be necessary to be able to build that, that ecosystem. You know, so I think with um, with that mindset and trying to almost um, 
bring people up to speed with what's available. I think obviously lots of people will do their own pitch for whether it's a corrugator, a control system or a conveyor or whatever it might be. But it's having that, that technical understanding of knowing what capabilities there are from the information from that machine or that palletizer or, th or that control system and how you can use it to build informed and actionable decisions to actually improve your overall end-to-end -end plant. So I think that's the, there's a learning for sure for on the personnel side. So from a skills mix in terms of the, you know, decision makers or operations people in the plants, but, um, you know, also the awareness of the technology and, and knowing, having that vision to, to put it together. Um, now, I, I'm going to ask um, the same question to both Tim and Martin. Um, and, and this question really revolves about, it's, it's a, a continuation of the, uh, the point that James was talking about there. Um, both of your organizations, I know, have installed machines at um, customer sites that may well have been uh, a sheet plant in the past, so um, or in uh, developing markets where the skill sets uh, have not been there. Um, do you both feel that um, the the latest sort of technology that you guys are developing? Um, have you eff effectively um, almost de-skilled? So in other words, um, you, you're taking multi-million pound machines or multi-million euro or dollar machines, and you're able to put um, teams of, uh, of operators on that maybe have little or no experience in corrugating, yet you can still hit great results inside of a couple of months. Um, Tim, tell us a little bit about, um, there was a particular installation you had down in um, South Africa at uh, one of your customers, um, Everest. That's correct. Yes, that was, and um, we were two weeks away from finishing installation when we had to completely pull out and, and go home. And so the whole of the front end of the installation, the startup, the commissioning was all done completely remotely. And thank goodness the customer had the vision to go, you know, he, he, he seen that some of these systems that we have in place, this, um, this interconnectivity between not only the corrugator and the systems around it is absolutely fundamental. And the whole idea is to take the skill away from the operator and have the machine, have the, the skills on the machine itself through different systems. And we see this is gonna just grow and grow with you know, you know not, uh, augmented reali uh, reality where we through image processing and stuff like that, it will see if the conveyors are full, if there's a, a problem with the trim jamming up, slow the corrugator down. And we'll have all these skills brought on to the machine. And it's been a trend anyway that you see the operators in, in the plants, they have got much less skills than they used to 15, 20 years ago. And the machine is expected to drive itself, diagnose itself, control its speed itself, and all these things will happen. And I think uh, as long as the owners of these type of plants have that vision, it's, it's a no-brainer. Martin. Same question for you, because I, I know that you've had some installations in some far-flung places. Uh, yeah. You obviously, uh, you know, have got the same sort of viewpoint that, um, uh, you know, technology and systems are the future of our industry. They, they are, they are, Dan, and I, I agree with Tim, and I think, you know, either with Paper Systems and, and Fosber are, are very much running a parallel path here with uh, with our customers to try and, take it away from the operator, take it away from the maintenance department and bring it into a more controlled environment. Uh, we recently started a corrugator up in Russia and then just like with Tim's situation, difficult to get people there. We had to do a lot of the work. Uh, the machine was up and running, but we had to do a lot of fault finding uh, remotely. And we already saw this a few years ago because we, we sell uh, sheeting machines into the paper mill industry and uh, they're very much a more automated environment. And they've got the mentality as the machine has stopped uh, please dial up and fix the machine for us. So that has been a, a good learning place for us, and we've taken that, those learnings into the corrugated industry too, so that if a machine does go down, we can go online, usually quickly identify the fault, and at least give the maintenance people a chance to find the uh, to fix it remotely if they, or locally if they can. Also, the the newer corrugators, you know, we we start off talking about these high performance corrugators. Well, not every country or region has a high performance corrugator or even needs that as, as Tim was alluding to. But those who do, they do expect suppliers like ourselves to have systems that will actually 
preempt some of the problems that may happen on the machine. And uh, we too are working on those uh, all across our different industries, but certainly also in corrugating, where we will monitor signals from the corrugator and then with all that data, which Dominique's referring to, what do you do with it? Uh, I was just talking today with an engineer and he says we have 1.5 million data points on a modern corrugator. I mean, they are available to you, but which ones do you grab and what do you do with them? And uh, we are running trials at the moment to try and help um, identify process issues before they happen, uh, which is where I think the corrugating industry is going to. You know, when do you find out if the board is not bonded? Well, if it's happened, do you find out when it's just happened or do you find out when it's about to happen? And that's where we are putting some energy at the moment into preempting some problems, uh, be it on the single face or be it on the glue machine, be it on the double backer, wherever they may be in the corrugator. And uh, that technology is there available, but it's going to take some clever minds to put the data together and make something useful from that. And that actually is happening as we speak right now in the US and some of our high performance machines. We are doing some trials at the moment on that. Um, now, I saw uh, Dominique and Tim were both waving there to, to ask a question there. Dominique, let's come to you. No, I just want to to add on about the remote uh, installation. I mean, this year has been a very special year for uh, a lot of us. And I, I think there is some some way of doing uh, business which will remain different in the in the future. And, tr and traveling is probably something which will change uh, t tomorrow. So the, the technology uh, now has allowed all, all of us to make some remote uh, installation. We have started some, I mean, some complete uh, uh, conveyor system without any any people from our factory on site. So this was impossible to just imagine a, a, a year or two ago, and now it has been a reality. So okay, it's a big, um, I mean, it's a, a big jump. It was probably too fast uh, due to the uh, to this uh, situation. But I mean, some uh, sometime you need to be able to move forward. And I think this year will remain. If we look on the positive side, there is a lot of negatives, but if we stay on positive with some changes, which will be important uh, for uh, the, the future and the technology which are able, uh, which are available today, the connected glasses and all those things, augmented reality, will be uh, something which will be common in the, in the common years to do installation and to do maintenance and to follow our job uh, remotely. Tim. You wanted to add yes, something in there? Pretty, yes, I was going to say pretty much the same thing, that we see that COVID is, is pushing us forward much faster. It's giving us a kick to, to develop these, these kind of systems a lot quicker uh, than we expected. And I think it will make us, all of us, come out stronger and better at the end of it. And the other thing I was going to say is, uh, going back to what Martin was saying, and what you, one of your original questions about high volume, wider, bigger machines, no, we think it's it's more precision, more industry 4.0, taking the skill away from the operator and having the machine do it. And the other thing I think we should say is the machines of the future, the corrugators of the future, have got to be more flexible. They're not only going to run digital preprint. They're going to run a real mix of things. They're going to have to run, a light, I think, a lot of fan fold as well for, for box on demands for, for the Amazons of this world. So we need to have to be flexible and precise. It's got to be, I think, also we may see a little bit of low-level digital printing online as well. So maybe printing QR codes or barcodes. So there's going to be a real mix of jobs. And that's why the interconnectivity of the whole plant is going to be vital, not only for the services, the steam, the starch, the waste management, the planning, how it's scheduled. And as uh, James from EDI said, we need EFIs. We need a, a plant management system that just ties all this together. And I think it's coming. It's coming. Step by step, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Ralph, Ralph, are you patiently waiting there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, pitch on a few points um, um, that were mentioned in the in the previous uh, discussions now. Um, in, in our view, we have to um, differentiate between two uh, levels of corrugators, level of customers. Of course, with a new machine, you have a high-end machine with a lot of controls, with a lot of data points, uh, and with a lot of uh, uh, big data that can be transferred into smart data, and then and, and. that's fine. We all agree on that. Uh, there needs to be a hub. Uh, different people do that. 
um, and, and that's, that's all good. Um, the mix and match machines, the older ones, um, this is a little bit of another challenge uh, in the US and also in Europe. Um, uh, there's a lot of very old machines in South America and in Asia that don't even have the capability of uh, collecting any data. So there is, uh, of course, an approach to these customers is totally different to the ones that have capabilities of being networked, uh, be interfaced, and then end. So, um, we basically feel the need for, for a company like us uh, to cater to both ends, to be able to uh, give an entry level smart factory, if you will, um, up to the, to the high end, uh, all, all uh, interfaced smart factory from, from the paper uh, wheel stock to, to the loading dock, basically. And there is a zero defect aspect there. There is uh, short orders to be scheduled. There is digital print, there is traceability. Are we looking at e-pedigree concepts in the next couple of years? Who knows? I mean, uh, it's, it's going in that direction. 4.0, we are traceable. Um, this is all good. But there needs to be levels of it. There needs to be entry levels for, for mix and match machines, for smaller, mach for, for, for smaller customers. Um, they need the process. They need process traceability to be able to reach their brand owner customers. They may be smaller. They may be... Uh, in a different niche, but they are playing in the same field, uh, really. So from our point of view, it's really a, a different concept for, for these entry level um, or, or medium sized machines to the high end machines uh, that are being installed today. It's, it's really a different world. Mm -hmm. Um, Simon, I'm, I'm going to come to you, please, if I may. Um, Tim mentioned something interesting uh, towards the end of his his last comments. He, he was talking about fan fold. Um, and um, it was interesting uh, because I read that you recently uh, did an installation um, on a machine in the UK of fan fold. And, and I'm just pausing a bit because... I think we might have lost Simon. <laughs> Simon's dropped off. Okay, classic. Um, <laughs> um, Tim, um, Simon, uh, at JKSP, they did a, an installation recently um, on a corrugator in the UK. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, widely reported on LinkedIn and social media. But um, um, Tim, talk to me a little bit about um, FanFold and, and, and where you see that moving, because obviously with the um, the rapid sort of development of e-commerce uh, packaging, um, particularly with, with uh, companies that are looking to try and ensure the correct size of e-pack solutions, um, do, do you think that um, do you think that that, that FanFold um, has got a big future ahead of it? I do. Yes, Dan. Um, and I think it's going to back. I think corrugators are going to have to be flexible. They're going to when you some customers will need to have just one or two boxes. That's all they need. And I think the fan fold and these uh, box on demand machines is is a good solution for it. So I do see, and we have seen, you know, when we're offering new corrugators, it's it's amazing the amount of times customers are saying either at least leave me space for a fan fold stacker at the end of it, or let's go straight away. And we've even had, uh, I know in the States, requests for fan fold dedicated corrugators. Forget the conventional sheet, we only want to make fan fold. So yes, it's coming, it's gonna grow. Mm -hmm. Um, Dominique, I'm going to come back to you now in terms of um, you know raw materials because you know once the um, the corrugator's done its job and uh, all of the materials are, are sort of buffered through the work in progress uh, area, um, we've seen quite a rapid development in um, high bay storage in European facilities. Um, and I, I understand that um, the first couple are now starting to be rolled out in North America as well. Um, give us a little bit, bit of background as to uh, why these high base storages have been developed and um, how they benefit a high volume um, facility. Yeah, so I mean, the, uh, the main idea of the IRX uh, storage is to increase the capacity of the whip. And this is uh, mostly to disconnect the production of the corrugator to the conversion on the, on the machine uh, after. If you increase the capacity of, of uh, storage, I mean, you can manage differently the output of the corrugators and the output of the converting machines. 
We know that uh, each square meter is becoming more and more expensive. This is true for, for Europe since here. It's probably true now for US as well. If you go to Japan, this is the, uh, I mean the, uh, the complete extreme. So, uh, so the RX storage is a way of g uh, getting more material on the same square meter, so uh, square meter, so the same same uh, value for the uh, square meter. But probably one one solution will not fit all, and I will I will come back with the same comments and team tomorrow. We need to be able to do a lot of things, being flexible. So we are probably going to some. Uh, hybrid uh, solution. I mean, uh, standard whip, IREX storage, maybe so, uh, AGVs or other type of way of transferring the board from the corrugator to the converting machine or to the to, to a stock. And uh, the idea would be to get a system on the top of that, which is able to manage those different systems in the most efficient way. And the supervision and the IT structure on the top of it will be the key to the productivity and to the flexibility being whatever solution which is existing today or could be uh, coming for for tomorrow but it's clear that the the we what we call the we uh, today in five years will will change a lot when you see orders of 10 sheets you cannot imagine that you have hundreds of order of 10 sheets which are moving on on belt i mean this is something which is not just uh, working so can we mix up uh, different order in the same pile so if it's if we do that or come for the converting machine. No, if we want to separate them, we find we need to find another way to transfer them. So here there is a lot of room for for innovation. And uh, again, the key things for tomorrow is uh, is to be able to manage different type of technology, maybe inside the same plant, the same plant, to be able to answer to the flexibility and to the different needs. Great. Well. Um... I think uh, we've we've reached a natural um, break here, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I, I think you know the, the the sort of the future of the the corrugating process, uh, looking ahead uh, to the next decade. I think it's very clear for, from each of you that um, uh, you know we're, we're we're sort of helping drive the industry forward with. Um, automation with Industry 4.0, with data management. We're looking at corrugators that um, are becoming more autonomous. Uh, we're looking at machines that are able to um, diagnose problems before they even happen. Um, but we're also looking at um, what is going to happen to our industry uh, as the uh, next generations of operators come through that are more comfortable with uh, with an iPhone and an iPad than they are uh, with gears and oil. Um, so, um, gentlemen, thank you so much indeed. Uh, I know that all of you will probably be on the exhibition floor. Um, so if any of the attendees watching have got any questions, uh, please do go and visit each of the booths um, for, for each of the gentlemen who've who've been on our line today. So my thanks to um, uh, Dominique from uh, Ducker, uh, Tim from Fosber, Ralph from uh, e &L, Martin BW Paper Systems, James from EFI, and uh, even though he's not here, uh, Mr. Simon Holmes from JKSB. So uh, gentlemen, thank you so much indeed. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the showground. Thanks ever so much.